please welcome Elizabeth Cohen, Professor of American Studies at Harvard University. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here as the token historian. Uh, I, I, and I just want to say that I, I, th I think, and I hope that you will too, uh, that it's very important to have historians uh, as part of these very important conversations about the state of our nation today. Climate change activists can take heart from recent polls that show a majority of Americans of both major political parties and all ages supporting interventions to reduce greenhouse gases and encourage renewable energy. Ferocious hurricanes and destructive fires uh, have certainly helped the cause. Those in favor are more democratic than Republican and more millennial than not. But still, attitudes are changing, if not as fast as carbon levels are rising. But the scale of action and the agenda for change that many Americans endorse is nowhere near as ambitious as what the authors of the Green New Deal are calling for. Not only are they demanding a total shift to renewable energy within 10 years, they are promoting a transformative green economy that will provide decent jobs with benefits, universal health care, and more affordable housing and infrastructural investment. The Green New Deal is thus conceived as the opening wedge in a radical shift from a private market-based neoliberal economy to a more social democratic one, where new federal policies will create a more egalitarian and just as well as greener America. Advocates for this revolutionary change have seized the mantle of the New Deal of the 1930s and 1940s as their inspiration, and for good reason. Despite all the backtracking since the 1970s, President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, designed to address the crisis of the Great Depression, remains the gold standard for the federal government taking responsibility in a national emergency. My research into how ordinary workers in Chicago responded to FDR's New Deal might provide us with some insights into how popular support might be mobilized for a change of this magnitude. Before the New Deal, many of the workers in Chicago's steel mills, packing houses, uh, and other industrial workshop live political lives defined narrowly by their local ward boss, Democratic or Republican, if as first and second generation uh, Americans, they even voted or participated politically at all. For African Americans, the National Democratic Party was the enemy, the party of the southern, their southern oppressors and the party to vote against now that they were living in the North. Moreover, within workplaces, unions, to the extent that they existed in the 1920s, were dominated by elite, usually white and native-born craft workers who aimed to limit opportunity for the more numerous, less skilled, and immigrant non-union workers. After the organizing defeats of 1919, unions held little promise for lesser skilled industrial workers. To the extent that working class Chicagoans could depend for survival on any affiliation beyond their own families, it was on the institutions of their ethnic and their racial communities, mutual benefit societies, building and loan associations, churches, and neighborhood mom and pop stores that extended credit. Workers also looked to the paternalistic welfare programs that their employers had instituted in the 1920s to protect themselves against the failed but still worrisome unionization drives that followed World War I. Companies touted such benefits as paid sick leave and vacations, pensions, and employee representation to foster loyalty in their workers, but their unwillingness to put their money where their promises were gave few workers full access to these benefits. By 1936, the year of Roosevelt's reelection, the world had turned upside down. Faced with a Great Depression of global proportions, Ordinary working class Chicagoans in a few short years had become enthusiastic, enthusiastic adherents of a National Democratic Party with FDR at the helm, 
voting in much greater numbers and democratic in national elections. That included African Americans, who increasingly replaced the motto, stick to Republicans because Lincoln freed you, with let Jesus lead you and Roosevelt feed you. <laughs> Workers took full advantage of Roosevelt's federally funded New Deal, benefiting from its relief programs, and moreover, they had become the rank and file of a massive drive to unionize industrial workers from across many sectors, coordinated by the newly founded Congress of Industrial Organizations, whose success was made possible by Congress's passage of the Wagner Act. By 1940, one in three workers in Chicago manufacturing would be a union member, whereas 10 years earlier, hardly any had been. The political landscape of Chicago had been transformed, and that's true for the nation as a whole. Workers who not many years before had ignored or shunned the National Democratic Party, had had few connections to Washington, and had been excluded from national unions, now identified with the national government and a nationwide party and union. Given the challenge ahead for the Green New Dealers to mobilize ordinary Americans for their ambitious agenda, it behooves us to examine closely how the first New Deal recruited supporters to such a paradigm-shifting program. First, Franklin Roosevelt and his advisors never had a master plan for the New Deal of the 1930s. Rather, they promoted and implemented a set of new laws and regulations in FDR's first 100 days as practical fixes to pressing problems. As time went on, programs that worked remained while others died to be replaced by new initiatives. For example, when the National Industrial Recovery Act with its voluntary codes of fair competition and limited encouragement of collective bargaining proved inadequate and then was ruled unconstitutional, it was replaced with the stronger Wagner Act, offering a clearer path to unionization. And it was not until the second New Deal, beginning in 1935, that a welfare state of social security, minimum wages and hours, unemployment insurance, and public housing would take shape. In other words, the New Deal was improvisational and incremental. Furthermore, to minimize the impact of the shift away from state-based federalism to more national management of the polity, Many federal programs were operated and dollars channeled through states, counties, and cities, injecting federal resources and regulations without marginalizing all existing loci of power. The result was a hybrid governance structure of national statism and persistent localism. Roosevelt pledged to create, and I quote, a new deal for the American people. This is a call to arms and quote, when he accepted the Democratic nomination for the presidency in 1932. But he also insisted that he was rescuing capitalism, not overthrowing it. And he never laid out a fully developed blueprint for action. For ordinary Americans, embracing the New Deal did not require signing on to a totally new radical program. Second, this New Deal of the 1930s, more practical than ideological, tolerated constraints imposed by its coalition partners, most tragically, powerful Southern Democrats. As the Green New Dealers have been quick to remind us, this compromise resulted in regrettable choices, such as the exclusion of agricultural and domestic workers, many of whom were black and Mexican, from the protections of the Fair Labor Standards Act, the acceptance of redlining in minority neighborhoods and segregation in public housing, and a failure to pass much needed anti-lynching legislation. Acknowledging the limited nature of the New Deal does not mean that there were not ideologically motivated radical activists who pushed the New Deal to make deep structural changes in the American economy and society. Left-wing activists orchestrated communist unemployed councils, socialist workers committee for, committees for unemployment, hunger marches, and radical unions. But in the end, despite all the hardships of the Great Depression, the average worker did not buy into an anti-capitalist message. 
Communist organizer Steve Nelson recalled how he and his comrades had, and I quote, spent the first few weeks agitating against capitalism and talking about the need for socialism, end quote. Quickly, however, they figured out that working class people were more concerned with their daily struggles. Quoting again, we learned to shift away from a narrow dogmatic approach to what might be called a grievance approach to the organizing. We began to raise demands for immediate federal assistance to the unemployed, a moratorium on mortgages, and finally we began to talk about the need for national unemployment insurance, end quote. In fact, Partly inspired by the failed promises of their employers' welfare capitalist schemes of the 1920s, working class Americans came to embrace what I have called moral capitalism. While benefiting from radical leaders, they more often opted for liberal goals to be achieved by pressuring employers and national leaders to deliver a fairer, more just capitalism, but not to refashion the existing economic order. Now, we might be tempted to conclude that the Green New Dealers should accept the inherent conservatism of ordinary Americans in their agenda setting. But the experience of the 1930s also reminds us that a radical flank played a crucial role in achieving even a liberal outcome. For example, left leaders of the CIO worked hard to cultivate what I call an inclusive culture of unity in the, in the union movement. They knew that their success required it, or else the ethnic and racial divisions that had doomed the 1919 organizing drives would reemerge. If they did not call brazenly for class solidarity, white working people might well retreat to their segmented ethnic worlds and express open hostility to African American co workers. Herbert March, a communist organizer of the packing house workers, worried about, and I quote him, a split of black and white and too many nationalities that employers would play against each other, end quote. Because radical leaders of the CIO pushed their unions in this direction, black packing house worker Jim Cole could claim in 1939 that the CIO, and I quote, done the greatest thing in the world, getting everybody who works in the yards together and breaking up the hate and bad feelings that used to be held against the Negro, end quote. As a result of this prodding by committed activists, white working people transcended their prejudices at a crucial moment in time. Thus, one lesson that the New Deal of the 1930s might impart to the Green New Deal of today would be the necessity of having both a radical flank of idealists to inspire action and a willingness to accept a more gradualist and moderate path to change. The history of the Roosevelt New Deal imparts three more lessons for the Green New Deal. First is the importance of leadership, both at the top and the bottom. Workers admiringly champion President Roosevelt. As steel worker George Patterson put it, we felt as if, and I quote, FDR was on our side, organizing with us, end quote. And local leaders, both in the Democratic Party and on the shop floor, managed effectively to bring a national agenda for change back home. Second, working people were mobilized within existing and new institutions and organizations, not as isolated individuals. Even as churches, ethnic organizations, and the like failed to meet the crisis of the Great Depression on their own, they provided entryways to new solutions. And I think it's here, perhaps, that we face one of our greatest challenges today. Even as people's social media affiliations have grown, many intermediary institutions, particularly unions, but also churches, clubs, and other centers of social capital have weakened or even disappeared. The success of the political right might in fact be attributed to the greater survival of organizations like evangelical churches, which have provided infrastructure as well as inspiration for conservative politics. And finally, the New Deal of the 1930s was most remarkable for how it inspired a generation of Americans to trust the federal government as capable of solving many of the nations and their personal problems. And you've heard this already this morning, and I assume you will hear it for the rest of the day. That confidence would persist during at least three more post-war decades. Today, however, we are in a very different place. Trust in the federal government has eroded. And as distrust has grown, 
Responsibility has devolved to lower levels of government and fed anger and disillusionment so visible today in Trump's America. But global warming is not a problem that can be solved easily at lower levels. National, even international remedies are needed for climate change and for a host of other challenges. In my recent book, Saving America's Cities, I have analyzed how this retreat from empowering the federal government has also fueled the current crisis in affordable housing and crumbling urban infrastructure. Mounting a Green New Deal or solving the nation's housing crisis will require reawakening people's confidence in the vision and effectiveness of Washington. The Green New Deal carries the potential of helping to inspire that greater confidence or of proving itself one more federal folly. How to play that hand shrewdly may be the toughest challenge of all. Thank you.